everyone, and welcome to video 8.2, Learning Philosophy and Design Issues in Implementing Online Learning. I'd like you to think as we work through this, this one is a little, this is the longest video of the ones for this week. Um, so what is the role of a design philosophy for online learning? And then what components might be part of an instructional design plan for online learning? So just to give you a bit of a sense of where we're going, we're going to look at planning for online courses and how we determine some instructional strategies. And I won't try to put you through instructional design in a 10-minute uh, video, but I will hit on some of the high points that you can then explore and examine further. So before we start, you know me, beginning with the end in mind, we need to get a sense of where are we going. What are the objectives, the point of the instruction, the point of creating a blend, the point of moving online? How will we get there? What are the instructional strategies we're going to use to get there and the delivery methods? And how will we know when we have arrived? So how are we going to evaluate what we've done? And how will our students be able to evaluate what they have done? And especially in the online environment, this becomes a tricky thing. Now we have things like online portfolio evaluations. What does that look like? How do you assess them? What does the rubric look like? And how will the students know when their portfolio is enough? So what types of things do we need to consider when we think of just the instructional design and the learning environment? They're up on the, the PowerPoint here. Who are the learners? What are their characteristics? What type of content are we working with? What's the context? What type of technology is available? And what is its role and purpose here? And then, of course, the assessment. How are we going to measure? How will we know we've achieved what we intended? So with respect to learner characteristics, the biggest tip is to know your audience. And all of these different factors, there's lots of different learner characteristic checklists that you can download and use. It sounds really um, quite simplistic, actually, to think of the various learner characteristics. But as we've even discovered in this course, as you start digging a little bit deeper, there are some characteristics that really are going to impact your delivery model. So one very simple one is time zones. I've put some tips up on the slide here. The second one is one that's really um, increasingly critical, and it's looking at learners as being producers of information. They're not just consuming it from you. They're creating and they're co-creating. One little thing you can do is a learner profile. And there's a handout that I will upload to Blackboard that you can take a look at. and. This I wanted to show you this image because um, often how I start workshops like this is to actually get people to physically draw a picture of the learner. And so this was done in China, obviously, when I was working with principals and headmasters of schools. And I asked them to draw a picture of the learner that they thought, the other principals, that would be taking their course. And then they described describe the different characteristics. So you, you, of course, tell them they don't have to be artists. This isn't a, an art class. But they do have to depict in their drawing what characteristics are relevant and meaningful for consideration as you design the course. Where this is really helpful is when you're then working through some of the nitty gritty decisions around assessment, around content placement. You can look back to the learner and just remind yourself of who you're dealing with. So the next thing, different types of contents. There's types of contents and there's levels of content. So the levels, Bloom's taxonomy, um, of course, and then the different types of content are there. Fact, concept, procedure, process, and principle. And of course, there's lots of different instructional strategies that are used that dovetail nicely depending on the content type and the level of knowledge that you're aiming to achieve. So the last point here is to structure for student choice but create choices that focus on higher level critical thinking and knowledge development. If you create choices that focus on that very base level of fact, then that's what you're going to get. But if you're really trying to foster the creativity, the critical thinking, the analysis, then you want to create student choice and create those choices to lead towards that end. So I said there were types of content too. So we've got the first bullet point we've quickly discussed. The other types to be aware of are criticality and difficulty. And this is where you're starting to get a little deeper into instructional design. And any of you who are really interested in that, um, please just raise it in the tutorial. We can talk more about it. There's lots of great resources out there for it. 
Criticality, you're looking at whether it results in physical harm, damaged equipment, or prevents further learning. And so those are generally touch points where you need to expand, elaborate, provide additional supports for the learner. There are four types of difficulty that a learner might face. They might face unfamiliar content, complex content, they may tend to overgeneralize the content or undergeneralize it. And there are specific strategies of instruction that you can use to help mitigate these difficulty levels and ensure that the content and the learner is having multiple ways to access that content and learn and develop from it. So of course, one of the things you do um, when you're doing instructional design is to develop the blueprint. And the blueprint is very similar to an architectural blueprint for renovating your house. Um, so there you see uh, in my lovely English slash Chinese, I did not write the Chinese, um, my, my analogy of the blueprint to the house. So the needs assessment is your foundation. The learner analysis starts to become you know, that grounding layer. You've got content as all of your framing structure. You've got the lights and everything being the media, like graphics, video, and audio. And the plumbing are all the different activities that you do. So just one way to, to think of an instructional blueprint. And so one of these is very important as you're entering down the path to developing content. So I've given in here, I've given some activities for you to, to take some time to do. Um, they're ones you may want to consider doing now or they're ones that you'll go back to in over time and spend some time on. So what about learning outcomes? They provide a statement of what the learners expected to know, understand, or be able to do and you have them to make sure that you're consistent. You have them so the learners know what they're expected you have them so you can measure instructive effectiveness and increase student responsibility in their learning. Writing them, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the SMART criteria. I apologize for the faint acronym on the left, but they do need to be specific and measurable. They need to be attainable and relevant and timely. And so now if you think back to your blueprint, you can take a look at the learning outcomes. You can take a look at how you'd structured them and revise them according to that SMART criteria. The other piece is to be realistic in your timing. So context and the learner characteristics really come into play here. If activities are too long, you're going to put them across multiple lessons. If it's something that you want them to do a chunk of work, then they need to have groups, they need to be guided groups. There's also class size to consider. How can you use activities where numbers are less important? How can you mix up the class? How can you do groups? How can you use debates and case studies? And then, of course, there's the context. So what is this learning environment they're going to work in? Is it a blended model? If so, what is the blend? What kind of technology are they using? So here's now where you start to get that intersection between the design philosophy for the program and the technology approach that supports that and sometimes they mesh quite nicely and sometimes each one can limit or hopefully extend the other. So of course one of the big questions to ask yourself as you're working in the design of online learning is if someone asks you, asks one of your students what they've learned in your lesson, how would you like them to answer? Are they able to answer in a way that you would go, oh, Yay! That's what I wanted them to learn. So this comes back to assessment. Have clear intended outcomes. Begin with the end in mind and don't forget assess frequently and often. It doesn't have to be for marks. It can be formative. It needs to be constructive feedback. Don't forget the feedback sandwich. Positive, some areas to improve, and then end with a positive. And activities should cycle between providing information, providing opportunities for practice, then some self-assessment, then maybe some more practice and some group assessment, maybe some more practice and some self and peer assessment, and some more practice and some final assessment. So there's a variety of ways to do that. The last two slides I've just put in here, just again for your reference, um, some strategies here about designing engaging activities and where to place tasks in the sequence of learning. And then this one is my favorite and it's, it's built from 
um, actually designing effective products, it's product design model, but when you think of it with the intent of a course or a program design, especially for online learning, I think these categories really are very, very relevant. Um, we want people to feel attached and motivated and excited in their online course and program. We want them to have a sense of satisfaction and feel like they can rely on this course and they'd miss it because of the connections they're making and the learning that's uh, occurring. We want them to have confidence in the course or the program and enjoy it. And of course, be enthusiastic. They want, we want them to know that it furthered their learning and that they can contribute to enhancing the experience. So for me, these are, this is sort of like that last listen, litmus test when you're looking back on a course you're building or you're looking back on a program to see, okay, am I meeting these criteria? Are these criteria meaningful? Uh, given the context, what do we need to add or, or adapt or take away? And then the last thing I'd leave you with is a bit of a call to action, I think. Um, and basically it's this quote that our students have technologies in the palm of their hand that are more powerful than the technology that originally put astronauts on the moon. So are we really going to ask them to do only ordinary things with it? And just in case any of you are wondering if that's really, really true, if you click on that link, you'll find a link to a comparison of the iPhone 5 and the Apollo mainframe computer. And you can take a look at the differences. So in terms of the synthesis question for this video, I'd like you to really think about how the overall program design and instructional philosophy impacts the delivery of an online program. Where are the intersections and where are the potential uh, bumps or hurdles along the way? So thanks very much and I'm looking forward to our discussion in our tutorial session. <music>